On time. God is good. Amen. God is good indeed. And it's a wonderful thing to be here again. Um, I want to excuse my voice. It's still not good. Um, I'm very nervous uh, because my voice is terrible. But I believe that um, we go we're put up a bit. Yes. Yeah. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Yes. I believe that God will take control. Amen. And um, see me through this moment. Um, and I trust that God has a word for us this morning. Amen. For all of us. And um, this is still the first month of the year. And uh, we really need God's grace to, to hold us through. Uh, we don't know what lies ahead, but we can trust God. Uh, the pastor says, said here, it is very important to contribute to the salvation of others. And that should be our prime, primary aim, to make sure that we take the gospel to those who do not yet know God. And by whatever means that God will place in you, each and every one of us will have a gift. Uh, but we know that at some point we will meet resistance, we will face challenges, but we know that the eyes of God are on us. Amen. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year. I really pray that we keep this verse and keep repeating it in our minds. Anytime that you come through a challenge or an obstacle in your life, remember, say this out loud. Don't only keep it in your heart. Say it loud that I know God told us through his servant that his eyes are on us. And I take that and I say that, I think I have to say that every day, you know, because I wake up in the morning and I look at the day and I say, God, thank you. Um, I wasn't able to go to work on Thursday because I could not speak. But I still say thank you. Amen. That your eyes are on me. Amen. And I know that the day we will not want that the gospel message should be preached. Remember the gospel message is not preached only on the pulpit here. It's preached through what you do. Your lifestyle. Where you are. At work. At home. In your family. In your neighborhood. It's not only preached by coming and standing here and talking. Because talk is good, but actions work better. People will look at us and see what we are doing. And they will know that there is God in us. Amen. And that's our message today. Our message today is about developing a gentleness spirit through God, through Christ. I title it, Develop a Gentleness Spirit. Spirit in Christ. And I will read the text that we meditate on comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians. We will be reading from chapter 4, verse 14 to 21. 14 to 21. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you shortly, if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love and a spirit of gentleness? 
That's the question that Paul was asking the people in Corinth. If we, if just, <clears throat> Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians after he had sent Timothy already to them. Because he saw, or he has heard about the attitude, the character, the change in behavior of the Corinthians. And he knew that he had to communicate with them and admonish them to change back to what they were before he left. And he sent Paul to them. And I believe Paul went and gave a report what he observed. If you have time this afternoon, you can read chapter 5 of First Corinthians. You will see the things that they were doing before Paul wrote that letter to them. But verse 14, which is the beginning of the, the, that, that section that I just read, Paul said, I'm not writing these things to shame you. I don't want to disgrace you. I don't want to criticize you. I don't want to make you feel bad. But I'm just giving to you as a warning. Paul sent a letter to the Corinthians. This letter is coming to us this morning. What do we see there? We can see that Paul had that pastoral heart of love. No heart of disgracing, discriminating, criticizing, and bringing somebody down. He didn't use any harsh word, even though he knew that they needed discipline, that he could use some very difficult words. And he said, I've sent Timothy to you. And he talked about some of them who are now boasting. They are arrogant. They have puffed up. And I asked myself, why did he say this? that the people were puffed up. And if you look at verse 15, he said, you may have instructors, but not fathers in Christ like me. Because some of the Corinthians were already not bothering who Paul was. They didn't pay any allegiance to Paul anymore. They were now paying allegiance to Apollos, to Peters, and many others. And then Paul realized and said, look, you may have instructors, but not fathers. Why? Because he is the one who brought the gospel to them. And when you bring the gospel to somebody, like it happened yesterday, and the person gives his or her life to Christ, you are that person's spiritual parent. So Paul knew that it doesn't matter. You may have some instructors, but I know I'm your spiritual father. And I've shown you how to behave. And it's good you follow the way that I'm showing you. Then verse 18. Paul talked about, now you are arrogant. Why were they arrogant? They were arrogant and they were saying to Paul, they told Timothy that Paul is only bold to stay afar and tell us things. He's not bold enough to come and stand in front of us and face us and talk to us. If you want to find out this, you can go to Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse, chapter 10, verse, no, chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. You will see what Paul said there, that he doesn't feel bold enough to come and stand in front of them at that time. But he knows that he will come. Don't feel proud that I'm not coming, because by the will of God, I will come. Why did he say so? Because they were now, the Corinthians, some of them, they have now gathered together and they are looking at Paul and thinking he is not a strong leader. Now, Paul, instead of sending, coming to them and warning them or punishing them and displacing them in a way, he sent them this. He said to them, will I come to you with a rot or I should come to you with love and with a spirit of gentleness, you have the choice to make. I found a quote which I will read, and the person who wrote this is unknown, but it says this. Sometimes in our zeal to, to clean up our own lives or the lives of others, we unfortunately use words of condemnation, <coughs> criticism, <coughs> nagging, feats of temper, 
and we think we are doing right. <coughs> but our harsh self-righteous treatment is more than they can bear. You see, sometimes when we see our brothers and sisters, our children, our friends, they do things that are not right. We may tend to be very harsh. Instead of admonishing them, we criticize. We may even not criticize before them, we backbite. We talk low about people, even our own children. We shout at them. Instead of looking and speaking in a way that will encourage child. Paul, look at this. Remember, these were his beloved children in Christ, in faith. And he knew that the only way to keep them in Christ is to come to them with a gentle spirit than to criticize them. If he had said, come to them with a rod immediately, that would push them away from Christ. And it takes an example that Paul said, look at me, copy me, do the things that I do. Paul was a good example, a good model, and a good instructor. And that's the same thing that we parents should do. If we want to bring our children up to maturity to be well brought up children, we have to show them a good example. Than just telling them. He realized that if, if he exposed them and caused them and bring them to shame, he will provoke them even more. Because sometimes a harsh response also causes that person to get angry. Because that's what some of us we do as modern mothers and fathers. We don't know how to approach our children. That's how some of us do like leaders. We don't know how to really approach the, our followers <coughs> and speak to them in a way that they will have a peaceful heart to receive the advice. What do you usually tell your children? I'm telling you this the last time. If you do it again, you will not eat today. <laughs> if you do it again, you will go to bed, you will not use the computer again. I say those things to my children. When I was studying this, it came to me, this is not right. Giving a last warning to a child by shouting every time. Very soon the child will think that our shout anyway. You always shout. And what will happen is that sometimes they will start shouting back at you. Because they have learned from you that to correct somebody is to shout. Paul, I believe, would have preferred to come to them with a gentle way to talk to them about their sins. But their attitude was a way that he could not come to them. Paul was not interested in making them fear him, but he was interested in correcting them and offering them a chance to respond and to be restored. Do we offer that chance to someone to respond, or do we hush them off and say, don't talk again, don't talk again. We don't even want to listen. Paul gave that chance to them. Even in the church today, some people's own attitude are a way that the, the leader cannot approach them because he knows or they know that they are resistance to correction. They feel that they are always right. They don't listen. And this happens between siblings. It happens between spouse. You're wondering, why should I talk? Because maybe if I talk, they'll not listen. Why? Because you have been talking quite often and you see resistance, refusing to learn. And what did Paul end up saying? Shall I come to you with a rot or in love? Verse 21. It is all up to them to make that choice. What do we learn from here? Paul is giving us instruction on how to handle personal relationship with one another. Be it at home, at work, or in the church. 
He started by building the confidence of the person. That means we must convey some sense of confidence and love first before we correct. So that the person can be in a position of listening. And we do that by modeling what we expect from the children or from our friends or from our followers. We model it because people will always follow what you do and not just what you say. And that's what verse 16 of that section of the Bible is saying. Paul chose to admonish, not to condemn or command. You have to do that. You have to do that. You are commanding. Give liberty sometimes so that the people can make choices. Why? Because talking is cheap, but change will result to a fruit, a good fruit. We can talk and talk and talk, but we know we cannot, we don't walk the talking. We need to walk the talk than just talking the walking. Because people need to see the kingdom of God is not in words, but in power. Not in words, it's in your actions. That's what we read there. How do we apply that? Because there is a big difference between knowing the right word and leaving those words out. You may stand here and preach the gospel, but your life is different. You can study the gospel. It's not just the pastors, anybody. You can study the gospel well. Go into the community, in your neighborhood, and speak the gospel to people. But your life is different from what you are saying. So there's a big difference. What do we need to do? We need to let our life show that God's power is working through us. People need to see Christ through the things that we do. And I ask myself, what am I doing now? And I believe that you should ask yourself that question as well. Where is my fruit? And what are the results of the ministry that God has given to us? Have you identified what ministry God has given you in your community? What ministry has God given to you? Has he given you the ability to sing? Has God given you the ability to play any equipment here? To come to church and raise your voice and dance? What ministry has God given to you? When I listen to what the pastor said, we need to encourage others to take the ministry. Yesterday I was privileged to be in the concert and I saw God's people raise their hands up. They danced. I look at the front. The musicians, they play instruments in a way that I cannot imagine. When I look up here this morning, I saw people singing and praising God. Even Emmanuel, which you know, he played the piano in a way I've never heard. And at some point, I thought to myself, this is God using that man. Because at some point, he was playing as if it was kind of a trumpet that I've never heard. And that's how you use the giftings that God has given you to praise his name. You cannot do all things. Don't think that you can do, you are expected to do what God has not given you. You just need to identify the little that God has given you to promote his kingdom and let people see the fruit. And I'd like us to turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 26. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 26. It reads, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I have always read and heard this section of the Bible that there are nine fruits of the Spirit listed here. But when I read this again, I said, no, there are not nine. It's one fruit. It's 
written here, not in plural, the fruit of the Spirit. And I begin to ask myself, why have they listed all these things and they have written the fruit and not the fruits? And I found, I thought to myself again, hmm, you cannot pick and choose. You need all this. You need love. You need joy. You need peace. You need faithfulness. You need kindness, goodness. You need gentleness. And you need self-control. Together. And what is the main thing? Love is blossoms through. And then all these components come out of it to form the fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that if you have to make peace with somebody, it means you have love for that person. You cannot make peace without love. And when there is love and peace, there is joy. Joy comes when there is peace. If there is chaos, there is no joy. Kindness comes because I love you. And I will be kind to you. Because I love you. God loved us. And he was kind. He came to bring peace, and not to bring condemnation. If you love somebody, and there is peace, and there is joy, you will have faith in that person. And the next thing here talks about gentleness. Love will, is an expression, or gentleness comes from love. And when you are gentle, what will you do? You will have self-control. When that anger comes up, you feel like acting with anger because you are a gentle person. You will have that self-control. And you will not just speak. You will not just act. And we saw what Paul did. Paul should have been angry that the Corinthians, they were behaving the way they behaved. But what did he do? Because he had the fruit of the Spirit in him. He had that peace, that joy. He was gentle. He was kind. He was a good person. He was faithful. And therefore, he spoke to them with a gentle spirit. He expressed that by saying, shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a gentle spirit? Should I be angry and act <clears throat> depending on your sins? Greg Abbey as a writer of one theologian, he wrote this. Gentleness is power or strength under control. Gentleness is power or strength under control. It's the submission of our strength and our will to God's control and purpose. So if you have that fruit, you will be gentle. And how do you become gentle? By submitting your strength and power and your will under the control of God. And I believe, saints, that that's what we should do. As we go in through this year, we submit our strength and our power under the control of God. Therefore, what do I say? That gentleness is this fruit of the Spirit that brings us under the power of God. When you are gentle, God takes over. Without gentleness, love will not touch others. The pastor says that we should be able to reach out to others. That's what he said when he was speaking here. With the gospel message. But without gentleness, the love that you claim that you are showing cannot touch others. Instead of helping, it will hurt them. Instead of being selfless, it will be selfish. And as I read at the beginning, you may think that you are helping them, but you are hurting them much more than they can bear. So what should we do? We need to submit into God's hands that he should take control. God will teach us gentleness in different ways. He can teach us using the rod 
Or he can teach us with a soft touch. And that's why Paul was asking, should I come with a rod? Or I should come with a soft touch, a touch of love. And if you look in Psalms 103, God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Paul didn't treat the Corinthians the way they deserve because they were sinful. He could have come with a rod immediately and caused them to feel more pain before they can come to submission. Paul followed what Christ is doing. And therefore, we have to follow the footsteps of Christ. Verse 11 of one, uh, Psalms 103 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And therefore, if we fear the Lord, he will not treat us with a rot. He will come with that gentle touch of love. Jesus is the perfect example of what it means for us to be gentle with one another. John chapter 4 gives us this example of a touch of love from Christ to an outsider, the Samaritan woman. You know the story. If Jesus has just dismissed this woman because of his, her sins, so many people could have lost their souls. Because he did not only reach out to this woman, through this woman, many people in that community were saved. As they were coming, as Jesus was sitting by the well, and the woman came, said, no, no, go over here, you are a sinner. And start rebuking her, criticizing her. You have had five husbands. You are a prostitute. And the, the woman would feel bad and walk away. But he showed a gentle approach to this woman. And she stood there and listened and had a conversation. And in the end, she took the good news. And so many people in that community were saved. That is the approach that we should be taking. John 8 shows another example of Jesus' gentle touch for the immoral, the woman caught in adultery. Remember, Jesus told the men, if you have never sinned, throw the first stone. Jesus would have thrown the first stone because he was without sin. But he received this woman, listened to her, and talked to her and said that what? Go and sin no more. What about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who was so, people hated him because he was a cheat. He has cheated so many people, taken away their money, and nobody liked him. But what does Jesus do? The gentle touch of Jesus transforms Zacchaeus. He approached this man and he said, today salvation has come to this house. We are God's ambassadors on earth. We should take the example of Jesus and take the good news to the people with a gentle approach. Not provoking, not criticizing, not condemning. For Christ did not come to condemn. And therefore, if we call ourselves Christians and we want to follow the footsteps of Jesus, we have to make sure that we approach those who do not know Christ with a gentle approach. And most of us, we are familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his son that those that believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We know this verse. Have we ever stopped at some point and think about it and ask, why did God love us so much that he sacrificed his son? The pastor was talking about this yesterday. And he said, all other religions, they expect you to sacrifice mm. money, animals, sometimes people, but Jesus sacrificed himself for us. Instead, have we ever thought, why did God love us so much that he did this? God
God's gentle touch is reaching out to the world. And it will be through you, through me. God is wanting to use us. If you go down to verse 17 of that very John 3, it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. How will he save it? By sending you and me to be on mission. Jesus reaches out to the outsider, the woman, to the immoral, to the unjust person, self-centered Zacchaeus. He can reach out to you. He is reaching out to you and to me. But how will we respond to these people? If they came to your home, how will you respond to them? Will you receive them the way Christ received them? Or you will condemn them and say, oh no, I cannot receive this. What about our church? How will we respond to people like this if they come into our church? Are we ready to receive these people People like this in our church and make sure that they are part of us. How will you treat your neighbor who is not like you? Will you respond to your neighbor with prejudice or will you have that gentle touch? How will you treat a friend who has been immoral and you know that your friend is doing all this? Will you condemn? Or you will have a gentle touch. What about those who, have dis, who are dishonest and are selfish? Will you push them away? Or you will have a gentle touch? The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, strength submitted to God. Remember, it is the fruit of the Spirit, one fruit which has all those components. And we cannot pick and choose. I'm a good person because I give things out. I give to charity. I give, I help people. People see you as a good person. But how is your heart? How do you behave somewhere? How do you respond when people hurt you? Yes? Do you have the fruit of the Spirit? What is the love? Remember love was one of the greatest commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Is it just the person next to your house? Or the person sitting next to you now? Who is your neighbor? The Holy Spirit will enable us to be gentle so that we can reach out and touch those different from ourselves. We can extend God's love to those who are lost in sin. Remember the people around us, some are broken hearted, some are hurting, some they need us to reach out for them. Some are searching for acceptance and they cannot find a place. Remember that God does not condemn, he loves them all. And it is our responsibility to love them as well. God develops gentleness in us through two ways, as I mentioned. Forcefully, with a rod, or with a loving touch. Forcefully. Remember, when you take wood, like this wood is quite smooth, like this. How did it become so smooth? Use a sandpaper. And that sandpaper is rougher than even the original wood. And when you use that sandpaper here, it turns to become very smooth. So sometimes God uses circumstances in our lives to make us gentle. Amen. So sometimes when we are going through certain things, we have to pray, God reveal what you are showing me. What are you teaching me here, Lord? God wants to develop gentleness within our lives. And sometimes it will be these difficult situations. And you will cry. You will be wondering, maybe God is so far away. But remember, 
His eyes are on you. He's watching you, seeing how are you going to respond to this? What will your attitude be? Will it be an arrogant and a stubborn attitude that you don't want to listen to instructions or you don't want to listen to advice? Gentleness can develop through people who oppose you. Don't think everybody will accept what you are doing. There will be people who will oppose you. You find that in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We will talk about that a little bit more later. Those who oppose you can make you develop gentleness or you can become so wild. Because in this Timothy it says, those who oppose you gently instruct them. We will talk about that later. First Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. It's happening right now. But I can give you an example in the Bible. Joseph. Joseph is an example. His brothers didn't like him. They threw him in a pit. Before he knew it, he was outsold to Egypt. While in Egypt, Potiphar's wife did not like him. Before he knew it, he was in prison. And this is telling us, don't repay. Did you hear at any moment that Joseph was reacting to what was happening? The Bible doesn't say that. He was gentle. That gentle spirit. He says, do not repay. Why? Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. The Bible is truth. Sometimes people oppose you. Even at work. Even at home. Sometimes your children, your wife, your husband, your colleagues at work will oppose you. They may even report you to your boss. But you know what? He says here that don't repay. Continue to bless them. Continue to treat them well. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. You know what? Sometimes you're working, your boss doesn't even know that you're doing your best. That you're doing very well. He doesn't even know. Before you know it, somebody has gone and reported you because the person wants you to maybe fall down. At that time, your boss will want to check. And when they check, they'll see, he was actually working well. She was doing well. She rather deserved promotion. That's what happened to Joseph. <coughs> Joseph, his brothers were against him. Potiphar's wife was against him. It was like life was against him. But God was using this as a way to bless him. Sometimes when you are going through torments, you are going through opposition, you are going through criticism, continue to bless the people. Don't repay. Gentleness can increase through correction. Proverbs 4 verse 13 says, Hold on to instructions do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Are you humble enough to receive instructions? Not just from adults, sometimes children can give us some advice. If we turn a listening ear. Being a teacher, you will, if you want the children in the class not to disobey you, model what you want them to see. That you want from them. And give a listening ear. Because if you don't listen and know what the child is going on about, you may think, oh, this is a stubborn child. And say, sit down, sit down. Give a listening ear. Sometimes the Bible is it good to listen to instructions. Hold on to instructions. Do not let it go. When your father or your mother gives you advice to the young people, hold on to that instruction. Hold it on because 
God has brought them to the world before you and given them the experience before you. They know better before you than you. Tomorrow you may become better than them. But listen to the instruction given to you. Until when your own day comes, when you are better than them. Proverbs 13 verse 13 says, People who despise advice will find themselves in trouble. Those who respect it will succeed. God is giving us instructions this morning. How to live a life that can reach out to people and touch them so that together we will receive salvation from Christ. Are we going to follow this instruction or not? If we want to succeed, let's follow this instruction. What is the purpose of gentleness? God's purpose for gentleness is not to make us a doormat for people. Okay? Because you can then say, oh, I'm gentle. And then you sit. Gentleness or meekness is not a sign of weakness. You have to stand up for yourself as well. You don't say, oh, no, no, no. In church, we learn that I should be gentle. No. Especially to the young people. You have to stand up. Don't let anybody talk you down. But know that you are standing up what? You have submitted your power under the control of God. And the words that will come out of your mouth will come out with power. Not fighting. Not quarreling. God will put a word in your mouth that you speak. The person coming against you will listen. So why does God want us to be gentle? Because it is to rescue and restore those who cannot help themselves. Remember Paul's instruction to Timothy. He told him, those who oppose him should be instructed gently. Why? I will read that out to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 to 26 says, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. If you are wild, the people will not listen. They will not. But if you come in a gentle way, God will use that gentle power in you to instruct these people, to restore them, to let them come to the knowledge of the truth and they will hear from you. If you listen to them, they will listen to you and they will get that knowledge of truth. Verse 26 says, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Sometimes people react the way they react. They don't even know what is going on. The devil has taken them captive. And now is making them do his will by being stubborn. Not listening. Not paying attention. Criticizing you. Becoming immoral. Doing the things that are all negative. And you know, God wants rescue and restoration for this helpless people. They have fallen into the trap of the enemy. You know a spider spreads out its web to trap flies. The same way the enemy is trapping out his web of sin. To trap us in sin. But unfortunately for, this, for, for the fly that is trapped in the web of the spider, nobody comes to their rescue and the spider will kill it. But with us, God is there for us. Jesus is there for us to take us out of that web, the trap or the snare of the enemy. And he wants you to be there for one another. To be there for your brother when they are trapped into that web of sin. To be reaching out to one another with the love that Christ has given us. To show the fruit of the Spirit by bringing the good news of Jesus to everybody so that together we will come out of the trap enemy and we'll be marching together when the saints will go marching into heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, 
The pastor always used these words, I will use these words, that you are not immune. You're not immune to this. So I would say any of us could find ourselves in need of gentle touch from another person. Don't think that you are so spiritual that you are not sinful. And that you don't need any help of anybody. Any of us can fall into the trap of the enemy. And I will need my brother to be there for me. And I will need my sister to be there for me. So don't sit and think, oh, you're I'm fine. One day, you will know that you need your sister to talk to you. Galatians 6 verse 1, I'm closing down. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a spirit of gentleness. Galatians 6 verse 1. It didn't say with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness. With a spirit of gentleness. But he wants as well. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, but watch yourself or you also may be tempted. Don't just take yourself and fall in it. Pray and ask God to lead you. Let the Spirit take you. Don't just think, oh yeah, I'm self-righteous. I can just walk and do things by myself. You may fall into that temptation and yours may instead be worse. Gentleness restores those caught in sin. That's the first part of God's purpose of gentleness. With gentleness, we are to restore those that the enemy has trapped. But at the same time, we are to be on guard. Watch yourself. Because you are going to a dangerous territory. That the enemy is there ready to trap you. So let gentleness protect you from falling into sin yourself. I said from the beginning, gentleness is submitted strength, power under control. Gentleness is love touching. And why should we be gentle? Through gentleness, we rescue, we restore those caught in sin and protect ourselves from temptation. Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. Bless you, Pastor. Bless you, Pastor. Let's all stand as we respond to what God has been speaking to us. Being angry, reacting is the easiest thing we can do. Being gentle require much grace from the Lord. Let's bow our heads and say, Lord, may we receive abundant grace this morning.